Hello and welcome into the KE Report. Shad and Corey here getting an update from Eric Wetterling, also known as the Hedgeless Horseman. And we'll put a link to the Hedgeless Horseman down below so you can follow along with Eric's work and some of the companies he follows in the resource space. Eric, always great having you on the call. And in this case, it was great seeing you last week at the Commodities Global Expo in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, a conference that had a lot of high net worth U.S. investors and about 30 companies there presenting. It was an interesting format. It kind of reminded me of a boutique kind of MIF conference ran into the Beaver Creek conference. So it was kind of an interesting set of presentations on one day, company one-on-ones on a different day, mixers and everything on a different day. So a nice mix of networking and getting some data on new companies. Of course, we all had a lot of meetings, but I'm curious what your key takeaways were from the conference first, as far as sentiment, takeaways, as far as the presentations you sat through, meeting with other investors, what were some of the key takeaways you brought out of that conference? I mean, first of all, I really liked it. I mean, it just reminds me that PDAC is kind of a circus where there's so much chaos and you don't really get to spend any quality time. Here you actually get to mingle and meet a lot of people. And both, I had a chance to talk to investors as well as companies. So you could actually share ideas and, and discuss companies that are there. And then you could easily talk to the actual people from the companies and it's like I didn't have time to meet everyone uh, but I got you know introduced to some of them during uh, the mingling hours so I thought it was great I kind of prefer such events actually because you can actually get into a story and of course I mean it's in Fort Lauderdale so I've never been there I've never been to Florida so I think the setting was just incredible so it's uh, yeah kind of felt like you said like a boutique private kind of thing, not with all the hassle of, of, let's say, downtown Toronto, and there's people everywhere, and you can barely, you know, meet anyone unless you have a booked meeting. So I I thought it was great. Also, I mean, uh, a lot of good and interesting companies there, many that I hadn't really looked into. So a a nice mix. And again, it's like just the fact that you get to meet some investors and, and hear, you know, what they thought about cases and the investment approach i would say the sentiment was i mean you you had some what i believe i mean appears to be smart money there it's like okay if you have and necessarily not people who are veteran commodity investors so it's just to see let's say smart more broad investors types actually be at that conference like okay if if they even see it's cheap then it's you know even more confirmation that this is probably the place to be right now. So Eric, in terms of types of stories, either that were at that conference or that you had more conversations about, look, this is a better market. This is a very good market for precious metals companies. Was the focus mostly on precious metals then? Mm -hmm. I mean, most of my meetings were with precious metal companies. There, There was some other specialty metals like critical minerals, critical metals, uh, also some oil and gas, and I, I'm not, you know, too ready up on oil and gas. So I would say there was a there was a good mix, and they had panels that discussed, you know, both gold, silver, critical minerals. So I think they had some people from uh, ex-U.S. military guys talking about the supply chain problems that faces a country like the U.S. So it was a, it was a mix of everything. It's like, hey, I mean, you know, I'm primarily gold and silver, but I like copper, I like nickel as well. So it, I, I would say it's a, it was a bit for everyone. Yeah, they even had a lot of uranium panels and uranium companies there too. So it was a nice mix of commodities for sure. Let's dig into a couple of the companies that you mentioned really got your interest at the conference. One of the ones we both spoke with and met with was Golden Caribou, traded on the CSE under the ticker GCC. What were your key takeaways from that meeting? Yeah, I mean, uh, as I've said a bunch of times before, or especially the last several months, is that early stage exploration stories are not that much of an interest, given that you can buy the uh, developers and you know even small producers, etc., way below some cost. But but still, it's like you know, in, relatively speaking, I think the advanced ones are typically cheaper. Uh, but in this case, for example, a it's in Canada. It's like I. I put more emphasis on jurisdiction nowadays because I think, like always, they're kind of going to trade at a premium, especially given the news we're seeing out of some jurisdictions like 
in Africa. But the thing that kind of hit home was when I realized that they only have done, I don't know, six, seven thousand meters of drilling or something. And they've already had like 100 to 200 gram meter intercepts. And I remember, and we talked about this before, the Kennerland study, which took a statistical approach to early stage exploration results. And it's like, I don't remember the exact numbers, but basically if you have 100 plus gram meter intercepts in the first, let's say, 10,000 meters of drilling, uh, that's a very good sign because, I mean, and we've talked about this before, that if you drill just a few holes into a new target, if you get good intercept, it's like either you're incredibly lucky and hitting a small sweet spot, or it's simply a sign that it's a very robust system that you can drill almost, uh, I'm not going to say wherever, but it's like, obviously, if it's a very robust system, it's going to be easier to actually get the good drill intercepts early on. So th that's kind of what, you know, I got that aha moment. It's like, hey, I mean, I didn't realize they drilled uh, so few holes up to this point and already get results like this. So that, that kind of made me go over the threshold to actually try and participate in their placement. So Eric, this is the Quiznell Gold Quartz project that you're referring to here. This was a past mind project back in the early 1900s and then it looks like there just hasn't really been any work done since maybe the mid 1980s but even then it didn't look like any drilling so with these early on results can you give us more understanding of where these drill results are in relation to where the mine is on this project any more information on the targets that the company's drilling please i haven't even dug in that deep yet and I, I don't think they fully understand themselves what they've hit. It's like I asked them, you know, what do you think the true width is, et cetera. And they're like, this is still so early that we, we don't really know. So again, th this is a punt for me. It's not a huge position. It's just, I mean, you can't argue with the assays so far. So it's like uh, what I typically do is if I find something that's, of interest, I, I take a, a punt, a punt position basically, and, and then, you know, invest and investigate kind of thing going on. That's how I typically do it because that at least forces me to, you know, start caring more about the, the story. And, you know, I, I think there's so many buys out there. So it, it's hard to put in a lot of time and energy in everything. So I, I simply think this is a appears to be a, you know, an interesting exploration store. And again, it's not, it's not a huge position, but, but I don't think I can be too wrong at this market cap. And I think it's also interesting, they're surrounded on three sides out of the four by Osisco Development, and they stopped drilling recently when I was talking to the meeting because of a hole that they put that really ended at the property line between them and Osisco Development. So there may be some synergies there and definitely teams that have both been successful in developing projects before on either side of the property boundary. I guess let's switch over to another one. And kind of this ties into the theme, Eric, we've been talking about a lot lately when we talked about some other companies of juniors going into production to get some revenues coming in so they can actually develop their larger flagships. So not putting their flagship into production, but putting a secondary project into production that's smaller and easier to get built. And this one was Denarius, traded on the ticker DSLV. They got three projects in Spain that are really polymetallic projects. You know, they've got everything from copper, nickel, silver, gold, all kinds of other minerals in there. But they're going to put a project in Colombia into production first. What were your key takeaways from the Denarius Metals? Yeah, I mean, I think, again, it kind of fits the criteria of what I prefer to see right now. I mean, like you said, these ones that can get self-funded. It's like they have the backing of Serafino. He's, uh, I mean, I heard a lot of people talk about his accolades, let's say. I didn't know much about him, but uh, it's obvious that he's a you know, big deal. The big cheese uh, got a lot of money, probably has no real problem making sure the company has enough money. And if, if they put that mine into production in Colombia, which is expected to happen very soon, I mean, then, then they're self-funded and then they can use that money to A, grow the product there, but also invest in their Spanish assets and it's like, okay, if we look at Europe, for example, I mean, they've done some changes to, uh, you know, the Critical Minerals Act or whatever it's called. So it's like, uh, I think actually Europe is getting better. I mean, I'm seeing that in Sweden at least. And given the ramp up in 
geopolitical tensions and all that. So the way I see it, okay, you get like one mine, three assets in Spain. You know, they're quite advanced as well. One is a past producing Lundin mining mine. Do I know exactly what's going to happen? No, but if you have like, you know, real deal veterans in it who operated in Colombia because Serafino, I think he built Grand Colombia, which is in Colombia. So it's like he, I bet he knows the country very well. Uh, so if you have that kind of I don't know, asset base, I, I think there could be some good stuff happening. And again, this is not a huge position for me, but I'm mostly you know, betting on, let's say, critical minerals in Europe. And I think it's going to get easier for them, has already started to get easier. Experience in Colombia, and you're bringing a mining production, so you get self-funded. Because if we have inflation and rates going up, I mean, we've seen the lack of retail buying, which I assume might partly be because people are getting squeezed. So th that's why I really love these kind of stores that have a pipeline and have a way of getting into self-funded production, like in internal cash flow, because in that case, it doesn't matter if the retail sentiment is really bad. I mean, that doesn't affect the margins really. And if they can use that money to build another mine and to get even more margins. I mean, I've seen some junior producers talking about dividends. It's like I never thought I would see the day, but that's how big... <laughs> The margins are right now in especially the gold space. So, uh, hey, I mean, if you can get a cheap bet and if nobody cares, who cares if you may be able to get dividends down the line? So I, I think some of these, again, stories are uh, very undervalued and give, give them a few years. If they work out, I think it could be a pretty good outcome. Yeah, let's not be investing in these juniors for dividends right now, Eric. <laughs> That's a process, right? And But we want to see these guys develop, generate some cash flow. What is that roadmap to mining then? Does the company need a lot of capital injection? Will they fund it with more debt that they already have? Do you have a roadmap that we can really pay attention to, to, to see when they could be in production and how they need to get there? Uh, no, it's the same thing. It's like I, I haven't dug in that much and I just look at the people involved, basically. I think actually the Colombian asset is almost fully funded, if I'm not mistaken. I, again, it's like I want a no-brainer to be a no-brainer. I don't need to be, if I need to be, let's say, precise, then it's obviously not a no-brainer. So I'm mostly betting on the people involved. They have skin in the game and all that. There's a bunch of uh, debentures that could uh, potentially lead to quite some dilution. And I don't exactly know who owns them. But so that stuck out on the negative side to me. But no, this, this is one of those, in my opinion, kind of easy bets that if you take those four assets and, and, you know, look what the market cap is, even if it's diluted a bit, I mean, I don't, I don't think it's expensive. And, and it's like, I think they're going to do the wisest choices, let's say, because they certainly know more about Colombia and mining than me. So if you have seriously, seriously successful people behind it, it's like I, I don't see myself as having a need to look over my shoulder and second out their decision. So I'm just going to basically let this one play out because they're going to be making better decisions than I can. And I think they are fully funded from when I met with them to get their Zancundo project into production at the end of this year. So I think it's like imminent. Like I think they're going in production. It may not be commercial yet, but I think they're going to be ramping up by the end of this year into production going into next year. And the idea is to take the money from that mine in Colombia, the Zancundo project, and then plow it into the processing center in Spain. And then they've got three projects there that were brownfield sites that they can, once they get that mill up and running in Spain, they can do a hub and spoke idea. So It'll be an interesting story to keep following along with, and we'll try to get them on the show sometime soon for people listening in and, and get an update directly from the company. Somebody else that's doing the same exact kind of model, and again, this reminds me of our discussions, Eric, with Integra, buying a producing mine, with Heliostar, buying producing mines. We saw it with Magna Mining, buying a producing mine to all develop their other projects. There's another company trying to take a similar approach and bootstrap it organically with a small mine process first and then grow it from there, and that's Sonoro Gold traded on the TSXV under the ticker SGO. They're in Sonoro, Mexico, and they want to do an open pit heat bleach project. It's, I think, a smaller project at first, and then they kind of ramp up from there into a larger second phase and other projects. You said you were just kind of working some numbers on it. What was your takeaway from meeting with Sonoro Gold at the conference? 
Yeah, I mean, I was really impressed by the team. And I, I told them at, at face value, if you look at the project and the presentation, it's it's not you know, an eye popper because it's at face value. Well, it is low grade. It's a small project. It's in Mexico, which has been, you know, almost a no go zone lately. But so it, it was kind of good timing, given what has happened in Mexico, that their, I guess, new president that they struck the part where they were going to ban open pit mining. So firstly, yeah, impressed with the team. I mean, they, they've done quite some stuff, not only in mining before, and they actually loaned the company money with uh, unsecured and all that. So it, it seems that they're really looking after their baby, let's say. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's also one of those simple kind of, you know, no brainers in the sense that you look at the market cap. I mean, the capex, it's a PA, so it's probably going to go up a bit. But according to the PA, 15.9 million capex. And it's like, if that w- would be up and running at today's gold price, th- that would be some serious cash flow, especially for a small company, obviously. A- and they think, I mean, they hope they can get the project down the line up to like one to two million ounces. So, I mean, I- again, I'm just thinking from a broad strokes or like envisioning the future that let's say you start that up i don't i don't think it would be a problem if they get the permits and all that i think they're going to be able to raise the money and they have some mind building veterans on the team so i don't think it's going to be that much of a problem to put a small heap leach operation into production so okay what could this small small company become if they get permits build that let's say gold margins are even close to where they are now and they get to internally grow the company from internal cash flow let's fast forward a few years could could there you know, be a good outcome there I, I think so again i'm not after precision i'm not looking for the sure thing because there are no i just look at the asymmetrical risk reward so i know the company's you know lowly valued in absolute terms and they don't have a tier one project but still again given the value of the gold business right now, uh, even a project like that could uh, make some serious bank. And if you have good people running it, so you're not going to get screwed over intentionally, I think it's actually a quite interesting bet. Eric, are there more risks associated with this company, though? Because the things you've said, right, small, low grade, not tier one, and the fact that, look, it's a $10 million market cap company. So even though they're, it looks like initial capital costs are about $15 million, their sustaining capital is $15 million, there is still that disconnect. So is, is this company higher risk in your eyes because of the fact that less than half a million ounce resource, gold equivalent, and again, it's not a tier one asset. So yes, the gold market's doing better, but aren't there better assets to focus on? I mean, they're, they're better assets for sure, but it's when it comes to investing. I mean, some people focus on the sure thing. It's like, oh, you, I'm going to buy the absolute best project out there or, or whatever, the best miner out there. It's like, are you buying a good company, good projects? Absolutely. It's like Agnico Eagle. They don't interest me, even though they are the best gold mining company in the world. I just don't see the obvious dislocated or asymmetrical risk reward. Or it's like, well, that's why I can't figure out why one would want to own Barrick or Newmont. It's almost a one-to-one ratio. Where, oh, you might make money if gold goes up. You're probably going to lose money if gold goes down. I don't see the asymmetrical risk reward there. In this case, where if it wasn't for the impression I got from the team, for example, and the fact that the, the resume is w- what it is, and that they seem to have, you know, quite deep pockets on a personal level, and they seem to have pretty good people involved. I mean, most of the time I wouldn't be interested in a story like this, but I, I actually think they could pull it off. Because I mean, if you have a bad, I don't know, team to build a mine, I mean, even a good mine can have a disastrous outcome, I was going to say, because we've seen plenty of cases like that. But this, like, you know, low tech, heap leach, low capex. Is it going to be a tier one billion dollar sale one day? <laughs> no, I don't think so. Could some stuff happen? Yeah, I mean, if they would get the product up to one, 1. 1.5 million ounces or even 2 million ounces down the li- line, then it's actually a, might be a pretty good project. And if you can self-fund that so you're not diluted more after the actual initial capex, 
yeah, I think some good stuff could happen. I mean, let's say gold goes up and they're, you know, in, in production. Is the market going to value them even close to where they are if they've shown that they can actually mine it and they show that, oh, it's not a nine year mine life, it's actually 15 with even more production. So I know I think you're going to make money in that case, but that's obviously not a guarantee, but n- nothing is. Yeah, some good points, Eric. It's a different strokes for different folks. There's different people listening with different risk profiles and different investing goals. But if you want to make bigger gains, you're probably not going to make them on the tier one projects that are already fully valued and have a million analysts following. You're probably going to fall companies that are not tier one that have more upside leverage, but then they do have more risk associated. So definitely people need to look at their own situation, and figure out what works for them. I think the biggest thing holding back Sonora Gold right now is the permit in Mexico for open pit which everybody knows is an issue. And once those permits start getting issued, I think the whole Mexican area that any company is exposed to open pits will have that rising tide factor. So we'll follow along and see how it goes with the permitting process. The one other one we want to squeeze in is we both met with Amex Exploration while we were there. We've talked about this a little bit in the past. They're traded on the TSXV under the ticker AMX, but they've got a key catalyst coming up in a PEA, a Preliminary Economic Assessment, And the management team really believes that while they got punished a little bit on putting out a resource that was less than what the market was expecting, they think when they wrap economics around it, it'll start to crystallize a little bit more the vision of how this is going to become a mine in their eyes. What did you take away from the meeting with Amex Exploration? Yeah, I mean, I I like the people. And uh, again, these kind of assets don't grow on trees. And I, I think we were let's say, proven to be correct when we talked about it. I think it was on the day of the MRE or maybe the day after when it dropped like 50% that, uh, I, you know, I've looked at Amex. I've seen the grill results come out, but the stock never really sold off. And and obviously that's going to create an even bigger following. I mean, the, the longer the period has been where nobody's really been disappointed, it just increases the following. We see that in crypto, obviously. And then then Marie came out and I bet there was a bunch of people again. It's like, okay, I'm going to take some quick profits here after they put out the MRE. And I think the, let's say people thought it was going to come in at 3 million ounces or whatever. And then it didn't come in at 3 million ounces, sold off. And again, I think a lot as always short term traders who were just going to sell regardless. So I think it got punished even more. And we talked to, you know, about the fact that, hey, I think this project is very much live. It, it looks like pretty good asset in, in a very good place, actually. I mean, the infrastructure and jurisdiction and all that, and that there's more exploration potential. But at the time, as always, it's like the sky is falling, people jumping ship, give, almost giving up on the stock. And then recently we saw uh, Eric Sprott and Eldorado Gold put more money into the story. So I kind of think that validates our thesis there. So again, I, I didn't look at it too hard when it was at a higher share price, but now when it's getting more de-risked and soon a PEA study, even though it might not be as big as people thought it was 100% higher, it might actually be really good reward because at least now you have a foundation margin of safety and it's soon going to have a PA added to that margin of safety foundation. Uh, so I think it's a quite interesting risk reward if you like, you know, high grade gold in Canada. And uh, a lot of people like high grade gold in Canada, like Eldorado Gold. Yeah, it's going to be an interesting story to follow along with. And I did talk with a company there about coming on the show and at least doing a, an interview on the back of the PEA when that comes out so we can unpack the details together. So we'll be looking forward to that. And I appreciate getting your insights on all these companies, Eric, and also just your key takeaways from the conference in Fort Lauderdale. And if people listening in want to follow along with Eric's work, definitely click on the link below this interview. It takes you over to the Hedgeless Horseman website. And as always, Eric, looking forward to our next conversation. Thank you, guys. And as always, consider me biased. Uh, I own a bit of shares in all companies I just mentioned.